welcome to the Right Take Podcast, news, ideas, and conversations at the intersection of politics and culture, a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I will be your host, Mark Tapson. Welcome back to the Right Take Podcast. I am your host, Mark Tapson. Thanks once again for joining me here at the intersection of politics and culture. As anybody who follows politics knows, diversity, equity, and inclusion, otherwise known as DEI, are key weapons today in the leftist arsenal to fundamentally transform America according to a social justice imperative to dismantle or deconstruct what the left believes is a systemically racist, white supremacist society. DEI has infiltrated every human resources department around the country in every field from corporate America to education to the military and the government. It's been a very subversive force that is breaking down standards of excellence and merit, undermining our military, pitting Americans against each other racially, bringing open discrimination into the workplace. It's just been a flat out fundamentally un-American practice that the left has made a centerpiece of its agenda. Let me read something to you, if I may. It's the opening passage of a brand new book whose author I'm going to speak with today. And I just want to set the scene for our conversation later by reading a paragraph or two. The book begins this way. Traditional understandings of equality and justice are making a comeback in America. Credit that in large part to a recent pair of landmark U.S. Supreme Court decisions that came almost exactly one year apart. The first, which came on June 24, 2022, restored the right to life for the unborn in America by overturning Roe v. Wade. The second, announced on June 29, 2023, took a big bite out of affirmative action. It did this by ruling that race-conscious college admissions practices, long perceived by many Americans as a form of reverse discrimination, were unconstitutional and violated a federal law that applies to all colleges and universities that receive federal funding, as almost all do. The book goes on to say, The deconstruction of affirmative action likely isn't finished either. It is conceivable, in fact expected, that the court's 2023 position on affirmative action will expand to the workplace. The 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution following the Civil War to ensure equality under law and protection from racial discrimination for all Americans. The ongoing disregard of our Constitution and civil rights laws contributes to a crisis of credibility and to a climate of hostility that pits well-meaning Americans against one another. Our nation is deeply divided. And I'm going to skip ahead a couple of pages to this part. Unfortunately, America seems besieged by radical progressives intent on ignoring the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its amendments. They do this by pushing divisive DEI training programs, which, to a great degree, have become closely aligned with the Marxist-driven philosophies and tactics of Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and the National Education Association. It's like our Marxist-influenced progressives have put critical race theory, political correctness, wokeism, and cancel culture into a blender and mixed them all together, served cold in how they undermine traditional American freedoms, thought, and culture. Okay, so those are a few paragraphs from the beginning of a book called The Adversity of Diversity. And we're going to talk about the significance of those passages with the book's author, who is my guest today. She's one of those rare birds, a black conservative professor. Yes, there actually are conservative professors in higher education. And contrary to what the left would like black Americans to believe, there are black conservatives, too. You may have guessed who it is I'm talking about. And besides, her name is right there in the title of the episode, Professor Carol Swain. We're going to talk about her book and the scourge of DEI in America and what we can do to roll back the damage that it's done. First, I should mention that Professor Swain will be speaking at a Freedom Center luncheon in Beverly Hills, California on March 29th. I just moved away from Southern California a couple of months ago. Bad timing for me because I usually introduce the speakers of those events and I would love to have met and introduced Dr. Swain. So I guess I'll have to miss that one, but any listeners in the Southern California area can go to the calendar at frontpagemag.com and find the details for that event if they're interested. And I do urge you to go and listen to Dr. Swain in person. Okay, stay tuned, 
and don't miss this conversation. And let me say, as always, please take a moment to subscribe to The Right Take if you haven't already, so you can keep up with the conversations that we are having here with important thinkers, writers, pundits, scholars, and storytellers. And if you like what you hear, a positive review would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, and don't touch that dial. My guest today at The Right Take was born into abject poverty in Virginia, a high school dropout who went on to earn five degrees at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Yale, and Princeton, and to become a professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt. She's an award-winning political scientist who's authored or edited 11 books, including the bestseller Black Eye for America, How Critical Race Theory is Burning Down the House. She's appeared on every media outlet from the BBC and CNN to Fox News and Newsmax, uh, not to mention being published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. She's the founder and CEO of Real Unity Training Solutions and the author of the new book, The Adversity of Diversity, How Real Unity Training Can Promote Healing in a Post-Affirmative Action World. Dr. Carol Swain, welcome to the Right Take Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm very honored to have you on. I've read your book and think it's important to talk about Uh, But I want to convey to you right off the bat a message from David Horowitz, who wanted me to pass on to you his warm wishes and admiration for the fact that, as he put it, you are just as courageous today as when he first met you 30 years ago. Well, you know something, he is one of the significant people in my life. And so it's mutual admiration. And I look forward to meeting him uh, sometime this spring. I think that we will be able to have a face to face. Yeah, I think it's at the end of March that you uh, are going to speak at a Freedom Center event. Um, And uh, I I had actually left Southern California, which is where the event's going to take place. I left there just a couple of months ago to move to Texas. So bad timing on my part, because I usually do the introductions at those speaking events, and I get to meet you personally myself. So bad timing for me. Well, I mean, it's going to be a great honor uh, to be with uh, David. I know for a fact he and uh, uh, the attendees at that event are really looking forward to seeing you and hearing you. So um, sorry that I'll miss it. Uh, Professor, before we dive into the meat of the book, speaking of courageous, uh, you are a black female conservative who was right there in the belly of the beast, so to speak, the progressive occupied territory of higher education. What was that experience like for you? Well, first of all, I was not always conservative. I've always had common sense, and I would argue that people who are born and raised in rural circumstances, that they have common sense. You know, if you know anyone who grew up on a farm, uh, they are heads and shoulders above other people. They know how to work. And I am a first, I was a first generation college student. And never sought to become a university professor. When I tell my story, it was people who came into my life who steered me and they didn't look like me. And I ended up in academia and I was, you know, steered into academia, but I started at Princeton University where I, where I earned early tenure for my uh, first book, Black Faces, Black Interests, The Representation of African Americans in Congress. And that book won three national uh, prizes, cited by the U.S. Supreme Court, chosen by uh, Library Choice uh, Journal as one of the outstanding books of 1994. It's also the book that Claudine Gay plagiarized, and I would argue built, she, she was a former president of Harvard, built her early career around. And so I did not have the disadvantage of being Christian, conservative, I was agnostic, always spiritual, but believing that one God, many paths. That's what I believe. So I sort of fit in. Uh, and I, and, and the reason I fit in at the time was that I believed in academia and I believed in their standards. And I would argue that back in the early 1990s, when I earned with the emphasis on earned, my tenure at Princeton, the standards were high. Racial and ethnic minorities, most of them, you know, didn't get tenure. But in the Ivy League, most people didn't get tenure either. 
But I got early tenure in the Ivy League because I did path-breaking seminal research. Well, you have a great personal story um, about your book, your new one, and this crucial current issue of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Why is this a topic that you felt so personally passionate about? Well, I can tell you that maybe five or six years ago, I don't know when Heather McDonald published the, the Diversity Delusion, I had a proposal circulating at the time, um, and it was titled, Why Diversity Training is All Wrong. And what I argued at the time was that uh, diversity training did the opposite of what it claimed it was doing. And at that time, it was causing corporations to really uh, to, to, to fire some of their best uh, um, uh, the, their leaders, and uh, and it was like undermining the the organizations, and it was over silly stuff, you know, political correctness. Someone insults someone, and it w- it also created a very divisive uh, environment. And at the time, I had not, uh, you know, connected it to neo Marxism. I wasn't speaking in terms of neo Marxism. I was speaking in terms of just what actually happens in those places and how they had the narratives wrong. And I've always believed that uh, the aggressive affirmative action and the diversity, equity, and inclusion was harmful to racial and ethnic uh, uh, minorities, but it took companies away from that mission. Yes. Do do these DEI programs, do they ever do what they are uh, at least – purportedly designed to do and successfully and improve an organization's unity and profitability and company culture? Or do they just stoke racial resentment and uh, blow to company's bureaucracy and costs? They stoke racial resentment, but not just racial resentment. Uh, The programs are set up to create conflict between men and women, heterosexuals and homosexuals, blacks and Hispanics, blacks and whites, uh, they just divide people, and that's always been the case. And I will argue that the universities, the reason they have so many DEI uh, uh, personnel is because they get evaluated on the basis of how many racial and ethnic minorities or how many members of LGBTQ they have on their staff, how diverse they are. And one way for them to get their diversity is to set up all of these DEI programs have tons of deans and deanlets and uh, advisors, and they can't these people uh, as part of their diversity. And so they had the people in African-American studies, in women's studies, gay studies, Hispanic studies, Asian studies, all of these programs that end in studies. So they had those personnel, and the standards have never, ever been as high for those programs as they have tradi- traditionally been for the rest of the university even though Claudine Gay's situation sort of throws that out the window now. But it's a way, it was a way for them to look better on paper as being more diverse. And then when those people, you know, students, you know, they got used to it, they made it so sacred. I would argue that many of the graduates from the programs that ended in studies, they have gone out into the world and they have become DEI, uh, you know, trainers and officers and and personnel. And uh, it has become an industry, just like we used to talk about the poverty industry. You had the DEI industry, and it's a layer on top of old-fashioned affirmative action. Affirmative action had its problems, but DEI is like affirmative action on steroids. It doesn't even give lip service to the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution or the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yeah, how have these programs gotten away for so long with violating, as you mentioned, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and uh, our nation's civil rights laws? Well, I mean, white people, I'm sorry, that this doesn't sound nice, but I think that white people have not seen themselves as being uh, protected by civil rights laws. And so they have begun to change and and uh, and file lawsuits and realize that they have civil rights. 
But for the most part, I believe many white Americans have just walked away when they were discriminated against. If a white man was told, you know, you're not going to get this promotion uh, because you're white or I have to uh, hire a racial and ethnic minority, I can't hire you because you're white. Well, you know, if someone recorded a conversation like that or if someone actually said that and they say it all the time or they used to, I mean, those are grounds for a lawsuit. I mean, that's um, but I believe that many white Americans have not seen themselves protected. Many of the people uh, in affirmative action offices and at institutions have not thought in terms of civil rights protections for men uh, you know, for Christians and Jews and for, um, uh, non for, for white people. They've only thought in terms of non-whites. What, what do you say to people who argue that if we do away with affirmative action and DEI programs, then we're essentially consigning minorities to being at the mercy of systemic racism in America? I would say that those are racist people, that they are so racist at the core And many of the arguments that progressives make in favor of DEI are are statements that show that they believe that racial and ethnic minorities are inferior. And I look at my own success. In fact, my book, The Adversity of Diversity, has a chapter about my own experiences with with an affirmative action-infused world. Uh, I came of age at a time when after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And I benefited from, at that time, equal opportunity. And there was outreach for groups that had been shut out because of real discrimination, because there was real discrimination that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was meant to uh, address. And there was an integrationist goal in the 1960s, we passed three major civil rights acts, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that prohibit, prohibited discrimination, opened up accommodations, and, um, and then we passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Open Housing Act of 1968, and we became colorblind under the law. And many racial and ethnic minorities got opportunities We had to work hard because I can tell you that I took remedial math at that community college. But when I went to my four-year college, Ronald College in Salem, Virginia, Lutheran School, predominantly white, I graduated magna cum laude, working 40 hours a week at the community college library. And, And so they opened the door. I had a chance. I had, and I would argue that I had an equal opportunity to succeed or fail. And during that era, racial and ethnic minorities, the many of the ones I encountered, they just wanted to get their foot in the door to prove themselves. And I would argue that women and, and, and the minorities who were successful, they worked very hard. They had to work very hard. And in some cases, they had to be better than other people around them. And um, I think that the race-based affirmative action by the time I got to college, I encountered students, some of them uh, black students, that felt that they owe us this. I'm going to law school. I'm going to medical school, you know, because they owe us this. And I can tell you that many of those students that I spoke with, if not all of them, they had GPAs that were under 2.0. And then I encountered other students, and their position was, We have to have, you know, affirmative action or we can't, you know, they won't let us do anything without it. I have always felt that non-discrimination and equal opportunity and the integrationist goal uh, that's quite different uh, from inclusion and equal opportunity is not the same as equity, that that was the right approach. And that if we were to follow that approach, you would not end up with lily white institutions. And to argue that racial and ethnic minorities can't compete and that if you follow the law that you're going to have lily white institutions, to me, that's just racism. What do you say to people who would say, well, you benefited from affirmative action. Are you 
do you want to deny us the same opportunity or are you pulling the ladder up behind you? You know something, that is how uh, whites and blacks try to silence conservative minorities. And I would argue that I benefited from non-discrimination and equal opportunity. And it was always, I always wanted to excel. And I did excel. I excelled at Royal College in Salem, Virginia, graduating magna cum laude. Uh, I was an honor student. And I had a goal to do that. And at the community college, I had been a high school dropout at the community college. First year, I made C's without working. Second year, I started to study and I made the dean's list, you know, a couple of times. And um, I always set my sights high and I never wanted to be an affirmative action baby. And so there were times that I struggled. I believe that what was essential to my success was that I started at a community college that community college did not even require a uh, high school equivalency to be admitted. You could get in there without a GED, but I had a high school equivalency. And I, I went to, from there, I transferred to Ronald College in Salem, Virginia. I did not have to take the SAT because I had a two-year degree. And so the purpose of the SAT is to see if you can actually do college work. And then from there, I went to uh, Virginia Tech. And uh, while I was at Virginia Tech, then the professors encouraged and pushed me to apply for a PhD. That was never something I was interested in, but they saw that I was talented. And so when I um, earned my education, there was a search for talented minorities. And one thing I can't deny is that I have a black face. I'm very black. And, uh, and, and I can't, and that's not something, you know, that I could hide. And so if some white person decide, decided to advantage me because they saw a black face of a person who was hardworking and talented, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. You have a chapter in your book about what you call the martyrdom of George Floyd. Can you explain the impact that Floyd's death had on the left's diversity agenda? Well, first of all, if you um, read any th anything that I've written or when I give interviews, I always talk about George Floyd's unfortunate death. Uh, I don't say George Floyd's murder because I do believe that um, there was there were enough problems uh, and politics surrounding his death that it's not clear that you know he was murdered. Uh, I believe that that first, uh, not that I believe, the first autopsy uh, did not say that he died because of the officer's knee. He had enough fentanyl in his system and other drugs, and, and he had COVID. He, he was complaining of COVID. Uh, and so I think that he died, uh, you know, at the hands of police or in the hands of police, but that it was not um, a murder. And I would also say that his death was politicized and he was made a martyr. But when you look at his criminal past, you know, this is not an individual that you would necessarily want black youth to celebrate and to see as a martyr. And I think that for the left, their whole uh, approach is never let a good crisis go to waste. And they saw an opportunity to use George Floyd's unfortunate death to push through agenda items that would never have seen the light of day otherwise. And so what we got was over 50 uh, straight days of rioting, you know, burning, uh, you know, parts of cities with no accountability uh, for Black Lives Matter and Antifa and for the progressive left. You saw them... Um, could commit these acts of violence and, and there were deaths involved in it. No accountabilities uh, as far as I can see. And then we now have, you know, the January 6th protesters and the two tier system of, of uh, justice. And the very fact that what happened on January 6th is so mild compared to what happened after George Floyd's death and the left made George Floyd a, a martyr. They have that narrative, 
And unfortunately, you know, their narrative will go down in history as truth when we know that it, it really is false. One recent incident that really brought this whole issue of DEI into the forefront of the nation's awareness was this scandal that was centering on Harvard President Claudine Gay. We've already uh, brought this up. You unexpectedly found yourself connected to that scandal. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and about your, your take on Claudine Gay as a beneficiary of DEI policies? First of all, I was not aware that she had plagiarized my work until December 10th of 2023. So I was shocked, uh, along with probably uh, the rest of the world. When I read her work, and I even went back and reread my dissertation and uh, my, my book, Black Faces, Black Interests, I was deeply troubled because initially I assumed that she would be fired by Harvard. And I just thought it was sad, sad case. Uh, but when Harvard stood behind her and no one acknowledged plagiarism and they decided to redefine plagiarism as duplicative language, I became quite uh, angry. I eventually calmed down, but then Harvard, she resigns, she blames racism, Harvard blames racism, and I became livid again. And this is something that I do have a law firm representing me. We intend to pursue uh, my uh, rights under the law. And the only way that it can be addressed is through copyright infringement. And, uh, and, the, and it's a complicated case because there's only two places where she directly plagiarized me. But I would argue that all of her early articles, there are three articles I found in addition to her dissertation that were basically, um, seem to have been efforts to refute the conclusions that I made in my prize-winning book, because my book argued that there was a trade-off between descriptive and substantive representation. You could have more black faces and less black representation, and that whites could represent blacks, blacks could represent whites, and that party was more important than race. And so that was something that had implications for voting rights cases. I would argue that the left needed a Claudine Gay. They needed a black person that would try to refute my ideas, they allowed her to get away with what she did because my book was so well known that there's no way her dissertation committee and other people would not have known uh, about it. So that's that part of why I'm upset. But I can tell you that Claudine Gay, if you look at her academic record that she got tenure on at Stanford, even if she had not plagiarized, it did not rise to the level that she should have been tenured at a tier one institution. And if you look at, um, and she won a prize for her undergraduate um, uh, thesis, as well as her dissertation, she won two prizes. I don't know if anyone has ever uh, examined her senior thesis at Stanford, but I would imagine that they would find plagiarism. I don't believe people just start doing that. Her, her Everything that's been published has had plagiarism in it. And so I think that uh, standards were lowered because of DEI. The standards were much lower than in the 1990s when I was when I um, started working as a faculty member. And, and so it went from equal opportunity to equity. She was the equity president of Harvard University. Her standards uh Standards were lowered for her every step of the way. She's not a sympathetic character because she went to Phillips Exeter Academy for high school. She has a Stanford undergraduate degree. She has a Harvard uh, graduate degree. She's had the best education America has to offer. And I believe the reasons Harvard has stood behind her and most of the people she plagiarized, I was only one of many. They said it was fine with them. They didn't have a problem with it. I think that those people were fearful or or maybe they plagiarized themselves. I don't know why they didn't have a problem with it, but I think that she was a product of a system that had lowered standards to the point that you could go to world-class institutions and come out um, with the inability to think critically, to develop ideas, to actually be a scholar. 
And she is on the faculty of Harvard still. She's drawing $900,000 a year on the faculty of Harvard, where she will be teaching lies to students about how she was a victim of racism. Uh, you and your co-author, Mike Toll, I hope I pronounced that right, Toll? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, you got this book out within just a few months after this Supreme Court decision last June, striking down race-based discrimination. Why did you feel such an urgency to get this uh, get this book out there? And what, what's the impact of that decision that you write about? What does that mean for America? Well, I can tell you that I knew as soon as the Supreme Court took up the uh, case uh, involving uh, against Harvard, and the University of North Carolina involving the Asian students, I felt like that if the Supreme Court was to be the Supreme Court, that they would have to strike down race-based affirmative action. So I anticipated the fall of race-based affirmative action. 90% of the book was written before the Supreme Court issued its decision. And so that last week of June, it was like pins and needles because um, you know, we had a backup title and we, we, you know, we would argue that the Supreme Court missed an opportunity that they could have done these great things for America. Uh, but the book would have had to have been substantially rewritten if the court hadn't struck it down. So it was a gamble. I'm pretty good at gambling on things like this. So I, so it came out right. And, um, and Mike Toll is, used to be a, a writer for the Tennessean, but he has his own company. And he, we self published the book. And so he took it through all the stages and he was my editor and we've worked together on other projects. So Mike, um, uh, enabled me to get the project through, but it was my project, my idea. And it really goes back to what I was thinking about, uh, five or six years ago when I had the book proposal, why diversity training is all wrong. And my position on DEI now, I look at the U.S. Supreme Court, the fact that they're saying it's okay for military academies to still do race-based affirmative action. To me, that's racist. Either the Constitution protects everyone with the equal protection, with the equal protection clause, or it doesn't. And um, the Supreme Court is just showing its own racism. And I believe part of that is that too many of their of the justices come from Ivy League institutions. And I would love to see an America where all the justices didn't come for the most part. Almost all of the ones we have for the most part come from Ivy League institutions. Those places are just too woke. And in this particular case, when they issue the right decision and then they step on that decision by saying it's okay to do in military academies, that's quite problematic. And the adversity of diversity, uh, in that book, we argue that DEI programs, whether it's in corporate America or in higher education, should fall for the same reasons that affirmative action was struck down. They violate uh, civil rights laws. They violate uh, the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And there is a better way. And I believe that we can have uh, diversity without discrimination just by following the laws of the land. Speaking of solutions, tell us what Unity Training Solutions offers, uh, what it does and how it's an antidote, as you put it, to DEI training. Well, I mean, it's a company that I birthed uh, a few years ago when everyone was being forced to do DEI training. And so there were some conservative companies that were under pressure to uh, do DEI. And I wanted to offer an uh, offer an alternative that would bring people together that would not single out anyone because of their race or their sex or their religion, where the focus would be on the mission of the organization and and on building healthy teams. And so that was the original vision for uh, unity training. What I can tell you is that people are not interested in unity training and I would argue that most of them uh, uh, that do many of those who have adopted DEI, they're trying to get rid of it. They're moving away from DEI. And so what I have done is sort of reconceive Unity Training Solutions, may need to rename it, because what I believe is that you have to work with the CEO, that it's not about training the employees. The person that owns the company, the owner, 
or the CEO, they are the ones who cast the vision and they have to lead from the top. And it can't be uh, human resources because all of those people are woke and they're afraid. They don't have the authority to make changes. But if you really want to get organizations back on mission and, and, and to develop, and if you want to get them back on, on mission and to, um, have teams that are healthy and functional where people are not being discriminated against because of their race, their ethnicity, their sex, or their religion. I think that you have to, um, you know, use a different approach, but the CEO has to set the tone for the entire organization. Yes. These DEI programs, they seem to be everywhere now. They've basically been implemented in every human resources department around the country and every arena from corporate America to education, to the military and the government. Are you optimistic that we can roll back the influence of these programs and eliminate them? Yes. And, and I think that my, well, I mean, it's not that I think I would argue that Claudine Gay would be uh, the poster child as well as some of the, Biden administration appointees for the adversity of diversity because these programs have been very destructive and they've been destructive in the military and wherever they are, they weaken organizations rather than strengthen organizations. I believe that more and more Americans are coming to that realization and that there's evidence that there are corporations that are quietly, um, backing away from DEI, those programs are the first ones cut. And they're being cut because they add no value. They create conflict. And so if people want healthy organizations, you can have healthy organizations, but not if you are trying to celebrate uh, everyone's special day, you know, except white people. You can't celebrate that special day if they have one. Uh, but you can't have the kinds of discrimination where you force people to participate uh, in someone else's uh, celebration. Organizations were created for a stated purpose. They have a mission and it's important to get back on mission. And I think that CEOs would like for that to happen and it's quietly happening and it would take a change in administration uh, to get rid of it in the U S military. And I can tell you that with president Trump, he was, getting rid of DEI and critical race theory. And it was the right thing to do because those programs violate the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause and our civil rights laws. And I think more and more Americans need to be educated about that. And that's part of what I do with my work, whether it's my book, Black Eye for America, How Critical Race Theory is Burning Down the House, or the latest one, The Adversity of Diversity. It's all about trying to educate Americans, equip them, get them to fight back. And I see myself today as a civil rights advocate for all people. And I think that many white people have lost their voice because they have been uh, beaten up to the point that they've been silenced. And I think that it's important for every American to stand up and speak up when it comes to their constitutional rights and their civil liberties. Do you think ending DEI will is the key to getting us back on track to a colorblind vision of America? I believe it will be very helpful, but there are other things like DEI is behind the anti-Semitism and the um, aggressiveness of the pro-Palestinian movement on colleges, on college campuses. And so that um, people need to recognize the sources of conflict and the problem with double standards. And DEI is one of the reasons why I believe we have an explosion in crime because uh, DEI and CRT, they're rooted in Marxism. They pit groups and individuals against one another. And in the case of crime, political correctness says that you can't talk about black crime or how much crime you know, that's documented that blacks commit. Uh, you can't talk about the, why there were differences in, in, in incarceration rates. And I think that to help the black community to bring about better race relations, 
there has to be more accountability and we cannot have a criminal justice system where police officers are afraid to police and where criminals are turned out on the street and all this bail reform and restorative justice. Uh, many of these things were ushered in by Barack Obama. All that needs to be undone. And, and if we were to undo some of these bad decisions, it would benefit all Americans, especially racial and ethnic minorities. What's the message that you would most want people to take away from reading your book? The diversity of adversity. Sorry, the adversity of diversity. <laughs> <laughs> the adversity of diversity is that there's a better way. There, There is a better way and that, that I want them to know that DEI is not the same as equal opportunity, non-discrimination, integration. Uh, I would like for them to have a better understanding of America's civil rights history and the progress that we had made and just how that's been undone by the DEI regime. I would also like for them to know that the DEI programs have not benefited any group. They don't benefit whites, they don't benefit racial and ethnic minorities, they don't benefit members of the LGBTQ community. If anything, it has created more hostility and divisiveness against gays and lesbians because of the activists that were emboldened by DEI. And then you see the rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Christianity that's taken place. And at the root, all of that is coming from DEI. DEI does the opposite from what it claims it is intended to do. And so I just want people to be aware. And when they read my uh, work or when they hear me speak, I want them to be emboldened and empowered. Dr. Swain, what is the best way for people to keep up with what you are doing? I am very active on X or Twitter. And every now and then I get some shadow banning. But for the most part, I post very frequently and I see my ideas, you know, being picked up, being implemented. Uh, sometimes there are shows and articles that I can recognize my ideas. I came up with uh, the phrase that Claudine Gay was a serial pleasurizer. I've seen that used uh, by other people. And uh, so I would say that X is very important to me, but I'm also on Facebook, a true social getter and LinkedIn. And I post every day. And so social media uh, would be a good place to keep up with me. And I have uh, uh, three websites. One is uh, Be the People Nonprofit. Another is carolmswain.com and uh, Be the People News.com. Be the People News.com, not We Be the People. Carol Swain, thanks for making the time to come on The Right Take, and thank you for your courage. Please keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for joining me here at the intersection of politics and culture. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Carol Swain's must-read book, The Adversity of Diversity. And don't forget to subscribe to The Right Take so that you can keep up with all the important conversations we're having here. And again, if you like what you hear, please leave that positive review. It's much appreciated. Be seeing you. The Right Take with Mark Tapson is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.